He used the geologist's hammer to pound in the tubes the only time the hammer was used on Apollo 11 but was unable to penetrate more than 6 inches deep. The astronauts then collected rock samples using scoops and tongs on extension handles. Many of the surface activities took longer than expected, so they had to stop documenting sample collection halfway through the allotted 34 minutes. Aldrin shoveled 6 kilograms of soil into the box of rocks in order to pack them in tightly. Two types of rocks were found in the geological samples, basalt and breccia. Three new minerals were discovered in the rock samples collected by the astronauts, armalkalite, tranquility ite, and pyroxferwatt. Armalkalite was named after Armstrong, Aldrin, and Collins. While on the surface, Armstrong uncovered a plaque mounted on the LM ladder, bearing two drawings of Earth, an inscription, and signatures of the astronauts and President Nixon. The inscription read, Here men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon July 1969, AD. We came in peace for all mankind. At the behest of the Nixon administration to add a reference to God, NASA included the vague date as a reason to include AD, which stands for Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. Mission Control used a coded phrase to warn Armstrong his metabolic rates were high, and that he should slow down. As metabolic rates remained generally lower than expected for both astronauts throughout the walk, Mission Control granted the astronauts a 15-minute extension. In a 2010 interview, Armstrong explained that NASA limited the first moonwalk's time and distance because there was no empirical proof of how much cooling water the astronauts' PLSS backpacks would consume to handle their body heat generation while working on the moon. With some difficulty the astronauts lifted film in two sample boxes containing 21.55 kilograms of lunar surface material to the LM hatch using a flat cable pulley device called the Lunar Equipment Conveyor. This proved to be an inefficient tool, and later missions preferred to carry equipment and samples up to the LM by hand. Armstrong reminded Aldrin of a bag of memorial items in his sleeve pocket, and Aldrin tossed the bag down. Armstrong then jumped onto the ladder's third rung, and climbed into the LM. After transferring to LM life support, the explorers lightened the ascent stage for the return to lunar orbit by tossing out their PLSS backpacks, lunar overshoes, an empty Hasselblad camera, and other equipment. Presidential speechwriter William Sapphire had prepared an in-event of moon disaster announcement for Nixon to read in the event the Apollo 11 astronauts were stranded on the moon. The remarks were in a memo from Sapphire to Nixon's White House Chief of Staff H.R. Haldeman, in which Sapphire suggested a protocol the administration might follow in reaction to such a disaster. According to the plan, Mission Control would close down communications with the LM, and a clergyman would commend their souls to the deepest of the deep in a public ritual likened to burial at sea. The last line of the prepared text contained an allusion to Rupert Brooke's World War I poem, The Soldier. While moving inside the cabin, Aldrin accidentally damaged the circuit breaker that would arm the main engine for liftoff from the moon. There was a concern this would prevent firing the engine, stranding them on the moon. After more than 21 and a half hours on the lunar surface, in addition to the scientific instruments, the astronauts left behind, an Apollo 1 mission patch in memory of astronauts Roger Chaffee, Gus Grissom, and Edward White, who died when their command module caught fire during a test in January 1967, two memorial medals of Soviet cosmonauts Vladimir Komarov and Yuri Gagarin, who died in 1967 and 1968 respectively, a memorial bag containing a gold replica of an olive branch as a traditional symbol of peace, and a silicon message disc carrying the goodwill statements by Presidents Eisenhower, Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon along with messages from leaders of 73 countries around the world. The disc also carries a listing of the leadership of the U.S. Congress, a listing of members of the four committees of the House and Senate responsible for the NASA legislation, and the names of NASA's past and then current top management. After about seven hours of rest, the crew was awakened by Houston to prepare for the return flight. Two and a half hours later, at 17 hours 54 minutes and 0 seconds coordinated universal time, they lifted off in Eagle's ascent stage to rejoin Collins aboard Columbia in lunar orbit. Film taken from the LM ascent stage upon liftoff from the moon reveals the American flag, planted some 25 feet from the descent stage, whipping violently in the exhaust of the ascent stage engine. Aldrin looked up in time to witness the flag topple, the ascent stage of the LM separated. I was concentrating on the computers, and Neil was studying the attitude indicator, but I looked up long enough to see the flag fall over. Subsequent Apollo missions planted their flags farther from the LM. Two and a half hours later, at 17 hours 54 minutes and 0 seconds coordinated universal time, they lifted off in Eagle's ascent stage to rejoin Collins aboard Columbia in lunar orbit.
In the 48 minutes of each orbit when he was out of radio contact with the Earth while Columbia passed round the far side of the Moon, the feeling he reported was not fear or loneliness, but rather, awareness, anticipation, satisfaction, confidence, almost exultation. One of Collins' first tasks was to identify the lunar module on the ground. To give Collins an idea where to look, Mission Control radioed that they believed the lunar module landed about four miles off target. If it became too cold, parts of Columbia might freeze. When Columbia came back around to the near side of the moon again, he was able to report that the problem had been resolved. While the flight plan called for Eagle to meet up with Columbia, Collins was prepared for a contingency in which he would fly Columbia down to meet Eagle. Eagle rendezvoused with Columbia at 2124 Coordinated Universal Time on July 21, and the two docked at 2135. Eagle's ascent stage was jettisoned into lunar orbit at 2341. Later NASA reports mentioned that Eagle's orbit had decayed, resulting in it impacting in an uncertain location on the lunar surface. On July 23rd, the last night before splashdown, the three astronauts made a television broadcast in which Collins commented. The Saturn V rocket which put us in orbit is an incredibly complicated piece of machinery, every piece of which worked flawlessly. We have always had confidence that this equipment will work properly. The aircraft carrier USS Hornet, under the command of Captain Carl J. Cyberlick, was selected as the primary recovery ship for Apollo 11 on June 5, replacing its sister ship, the LPH USS Princeton, which had recovered Apollo 10 on May 26. On reaching Pearl Harbor on July 5, Hornet embarked the Sikorsky Shish 3 Sea King helicopters of HS-4, a unit which specialized in recovery of Apollo spacecraft, specialized divers of UDT Detachment Apollo, a 35-man NASA recovery team, and about 120 media representatives. To make room, most of Hornet's air wing was left behind in Long Beach. After a night on board, they would fly to Hornet in Marine One for a few hours of ceremonies. On arrival aboard Hornet, the party was greeted by the Commander-in-Chief, Pacific Command, Admiral John S. McCain Jr., and NASA Administrator Thomas O. Payne, who flew to Hornet from Pago Pago in one of Hornet's carrier onboard delivery aircraft. In this case, because they were extending the re-entry but not actually skipping out, P-66 was not invoked and instead, P-65 led directly to P-67. The crew were also warned they would not be in a full lift attitude when they entered P-67. The first program's acceleration subjected the astronauts to 6.5 standard gravities, the second, to 6.0 standard gravities. Before dawn on July 24, Hornet launched four Sea King helicopters and three Grumman E-1 tracers. At 1644 Coordinated Universal Time Columbia's drogue parachutes were deployed. Seven minutes later Columbia struck the water forcefully 2,660 kilometers east of Wake Island, 380 kilometers south of Johnston Atoll, and 24 kilometers from Hornet, at 13 degrees 19 and 169 degrees 9 feet W. 82 degrees Fahrenheit with 6 feet seas and winds at 17 knots from the east were reported under broken clouds at 1,500 feet with visibility of 10 nautical miles at the recovery site. During splashdown, Columbia landed upside down but was righted within 10 minutes by flotation bags activated by the astronauts. More divers attached flotation collars to stabilize the module and positioned rafts for astronaut extraction. The divers then passed biological isolation garments to the astronauts and assisted them into the life raft. The possibility of bringing back pathogens from the lunar surface was considered remote, but NASA took precautions at the recovery site. 